Mike Carey's time writing the X-Men from 2006 to 2012 is the second longest consecutive run by any creator in Marvel history, trailing only Chris Claremont. And despite a goldmine of concepts and character studies, the run is frequently overlooked in broader discussion of the best X-Men comics. Certainly, Carey's work is referenced nowhere near as often as Grant Morrison's time on New X-Men, or even later runs by Brian Michael Bendis on All New X-Men and Uncanny. Today I'll answer, what's the legacy of Carey's work on X-Men? What concepts and ideas influence Hickman's X-Men and the Dawn of X, and theories and predictions that stem from Carey's run for Hickman's X-Men? I'm Dave Busing, you're listening to Crack and Krakoa number 52. I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald. You can find full X-Men and comic book reading orders over on comicbookherald.com. If you like the CBH YouTube channel or podcast or website, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Links to CBH channels and Patreon support are included in the show notes. Spoilers for Discuss Comics, including all of the Mike Carey X-Men run, follow. Following well-regarded comic runs on Lucifer and Hellblazer, among plenty of other work, Carey took on adjectiveless X-Men in 2006 with issue number 188. The title takes place post House of M, post Scarlet Witch Declaration of No More Mutants during the Decimation Era. Carey's entire run on X-Men and Legacy, what it would evolve into, is very much integrated into the X-Men continuity of the time, progressing from Decimation to Messiah Complex to Dark Reign to Necrotia to Second Coming to Age of X to Regenesis. Considering only one of those events is Mike Carey's own, it's an impressive feat collaborating and rolling with broader storylines and shifts in status quo for the mutants. Carey's work is also very much a fan favorite, and according to current X-Men mastermind Jonathan Hickman, in an interview with Adventures in Poor Taste, criminally underrated. The underrated nature of the run can probably be attributed to operating in the shadows of larger X-Men franchises. For example, Carey's X-Men launched alongside Ed Brubaker taking over Uncanny X-Men after his work on Captain America the Winter Soldier. In the absence of a central go-to story highlight that stands out individually, the Age of X event was likely the greatest op here, and although it's fascinating, I wouldn't call it great, you know, highly recommended on its own terms necessarily, but we'll get to that. In many ways, the run's greatest strengths, complex integration of long-running and developing X-Men continuity, deep, slow builds of the characters Professor X, Rogue, Gambit, and occasionally Magneto, are what keep it a mild secret for casual comics readers. Nonetheless, aside from Claremont's 16 years with the X-Verse from 75 to 1991, and arguably the Scott Lobdell and Chris Bacalo era of Generation X, no X-Men comics have a greater influence on the 2019 and 2020 Dawn of X. Regular artistic contributions from Chris Bacalo, Clay Mann, Scott Eaton, and Steve Kurth should be highlighted here with Carrie as well. All right, we're going to take this in eras. The first is X-Men and the Children. The clearest influence, and the one I've already discussed the most, is right there in Carrie's first story arc with artist Chris Bacalo, with the introduction of the Children of the Vault in the Supernova story. The Children are a post-human species that spent an estimated centuries in accelerated sealed time, developing beyond advanced technologies that more or less manifest as superpowers. As I identified in previous Kraken Krakoas, the Children are very much in line with the human threats of Moira 6 life, human adaptation along technological lines. In X-Men number 5, Professor X goes so far as to call them the greatest threat to mutant kind. The Children consider themselves Earth's superior inheritors, and plan to wipe the planet clean so their enhanced kind can ascend. As written by Carrie, the children are consistently more powerful than mutant kind, and it's generally thought some sort of deus ex machina, or through some sort of deus ex machina, an unexpected turn of events. In Supernovas, it's the X-Men more or less encouraging Mystique and Lady Mastermind to trick and kill a number of the children that the X-Men do survive. With the children emerging as early as Hickman and Lionel Francis use X-Men number one in the Dawn of X, they remain the most direct connection from Mike Carey's X-Men to the Krakoa era. It's a story well worth reading and not at all difficult to see why Hickman drew inspiration from it because it's a fascinating concept that very much ties into themes he is very interested in. It's the influences beyond what's already been heavily utilized that strike me the most in 2020, though, such as Carrie's clear interest in Exodus, Bennett du Paris, as this tremendously powerful mutant follower of Magneto now branching out in his own path of mutant dominance. In X-Men, Exodus and his new acolytes also have a genuinely intriguing plan, seeking to combine Cable's knowledge of the future and the Destiny Diaries in order to predict when mutants will begin repopulating the planet. Not for nothing, the story's revelation that mutant kind is a truly endangered species, also the title of a series of backups Carrie writes about Beast trying to solve for decimation, Exodus turns to Mr. Sinister and his master plan for the species' survival. Exodus spans both the early X-Men days and the Professor X focus of X-Men Legacy, and the Omega-level telekinetic is now a part of Jonathan Hickman's Quiet Council of Krakoa, as well as his go-to campfire storyteller for the kids. 
Apart from his 90s origins, and that wild Black Knight one-shot that connects Exodus, Black Knight, Cersei the Eternals, and the ever loving Apocalypse, Carey's work is without question what I think of first when I think of Exodus, and a clear fountain that Hickman is drawing from in his own evolution of the character. There's also the selective re-emergence of Destiny's Diaries, a loaded concept from Chris Claremont's early 2000s return to extreme X-Men, and a reflection of the supporting but obviously relevant role Destiny will play in the run. In the Carry run, Destiny's Diaries are hunted as the key to unlocking the survival of mutant kind. The Destiny Diaries are a super fun artifact in X-Men lore, the recorded futures written by Irene Adler as her powers manifested for the first time. As Claremont writes in Extreme X-Men No. 1, much of the entries in her diaries was written in languages unknown to her, in code and in pictograms. If that doesn't set the stage for a Krakoan revival, potentially, I don't know what does. Then again, I'm not a creator here. Really, I don't know what does. Adjectivalist ends with both a build and tie-in to Messiah Complex, marking a breakpoint in Carrie's run from X-Men number 188 to 207. This is the 2004 to 2007 run, for those of you looking on Marvel Unlimited, as the title would become X-Men Legacy after this point in time. Crucially, the rush to Messiah Complex affords Carrie a focus on Mr. Sinister and his reassembled Marauders. The exploration of Mr. Sinister would continue successfully into Legacy. I really don't think it can be overstated how well Carrie bounces off larger line-wide events and crossovers without missing a beat, and often using the occasion to add exciting ideas that simply wouldn't have been possible previously. Which brings us to era number two, Professor X and Sinister Secrets. Following Messiah Complex, an X-Men crossover about the birth of the first mutant since Decimation, Carrie picks up the pieces of Professor X, literally gunned down by Bishop of all people, it was an accident, and thought dead at the event's conclusion. X-Men Legacy number 208 to 225 is a remarkable character study of Charles Xavier, something I celebrated in my very first episode of Kraken Krakoa with the history of Professor X. Here I'll go into a little bit greater detail about this era. Big picture, Carrie really captures the complexity and contradictions of Professor X, riding into X-Men Legacy in the wake of X-Men Deadly Genesis and New Avengers Illuminati amidst the confrontation of some of his greatest failures and ethical compromises. For those House of X readers, missing the kindly 90s animated Patrick Stewart professor, Legacy captures a more introspective version, trying to make his many wrongs right but essentially acknowledging that his methods have been far from the purest. It's a needed quest for atonement that allows the character attempted heroism without erasing the shadows of his past. Speaking of shadows and impurities, after his resuscitation by Exodus the new, and the New Acolytes and a little bit of help from Magneto, Professor X uncovers a sinister secret lurking in the back of his consciousness. The coolest trick Carrie pulls here is that Sinister's presence is part of a decades-long plan to make himself immortal, or, you know, more immortal, all deeply integrated into the fabric of Professor X's childhood. Cooler still, Carrie revises, or, yeah, revises Professor X's past so that his father, his stepfather, Kurt Marco, and Sinister masquerading as Dr. Milbury, and, get this, Irene Adler, aka Destiny, were all part of a collective of geneticists working in Alan Magardo and have a role in Professor X's background. Sinister's ultimate plan is to write his own genes into Charles Xavier as a child, among others, including Sebastian Shaw, so that if his person was threatened, he could back himself up in an extraordinarily powerful mutant body. As Sinister puts it, I can write myself, my mind, my physical matrix, even my memories, onto the mind and body of someone else. Honestly, in a lot of ways, Sinister's own resurrection protocols kind of dwarf Krakoa's, although, of course, Sinister is only securing these methods for himself, not all of mutant kind. It's a very in-character plot for Mr. Sinister, here in a pre-everything-is-sinister phase as we've seen him execute similar background operations on the lives of very various X-Men, most memorably Scott Summers. Xavier confronts Scott with this unsettling reality, um, you know, telling him, hey, Sinister was everyone in your orphanage, might he be elsewhere in your life, might be he be integrated in your DNA as well. The entire plot leaves a lot of wiggle room for House of X and Hickman-era X-Men theories, and frankly adds plenty of credence to those House of X, Powers of X readers still wondering if this is actually Professor X plotting Krakoa. Even if the story is not quite so literal as to feature Sinister actually masquerading as the Professor, there's a question of Sinister's influence on the Professor over this entire timeline. Sinister is certainly hinting that the Professor's actions could never fully be his own, but lies, deceit, and manipulation are the name of Sinister's game. For my money, I think a The Professor was Sinister the whole time twist is too obvious for everyone involved, but I'm never ruling out Sinister lying in wait where we least expect him. 
I'm not sure of the broader implications, but I also can't help but call out X-Men Legacy number 219 as one of my absolute favorite single issues of the carry years, focusing on a diner confrontation between Professor X and the Juggernaut. If you've ever wanted the rival stepbrothers dynamic in miniature, this is definitely the issue for you, and I would say required reading prior to the eventual uh, Juggernaut miniseries that has been announced as part of the Dawn. Era number three in the Mike Carey run, Rogue, Gambit, and Magneto. Beginning with X-Men Legacy number 220, Carey shifts the character study back to a favorite from his start on the run, Rogue. The book is still very much an X-Men title at heart. We spend plenty of time on Utopia with Cyclops, Emma Frost, Dr. Nemesis, and the whole essential crew, such as Nightcrawler gloriously sassing Magneto in the field, but more often than not, it's through the lens of Rogue, with supporting focus on Gambit and Magneto, two historical romantic pairings for Rogue. I actually like to think of this period as one where Rogue takes on a role similar to the Doctor in Doctor Who, or even Dream of the Endless in Sandman. The story can run in a million directions, but she'll always make an appearance and play a role. Within that framework, Carrie consistently makes interesting choices when plucking characters and elements from X-Men history and weaving them into something new. Again, it's easy to identify a large swath of choices that connect back to the Hickman era. The first and most obvious is the return of the Children of the Vault. The children return via their floating atemporal city of Quetado, and it's not quite as exciting as the team's debut, although even here we get more insight into the function and formation of the children, their rules, their society, their plans for a new world, and we see them explicitly identifying as post-human, which snaps my mind forward to Myra's six life. I also love the potential of a detail the children tell Rogue during their inevitable fall at the hands of the X-Men, mentioning their plans. We'll make our own world, here in the void between dimensions. This has a lot of potential for the Hickman era, either tying to interstellar travel via black holes, or possibly with the vault inhabiting the limbo-like space where Apocalypse's first horseman and seemingly old man Cable, if you remember the very end of Cable number one, might be trapped. One of my favorite developments elsewhere is a fondness of carries for playing with precogs, as Blindfold becomes a recurring player and Destiny is notably utilized during the Necrotia event, i.e. she's brought back from the dead as part of Selene's grand schemes. Blindfold, aka Root, Ru Ruth Aldine has the mutant ability of clairvoyance, although her messages usually arrive jumbled and difficult to piece together. Given Moira's fear of precognitive mutants on Krakoa and her particular enmity towards Destiny, there are many fascinating moments. I was especially struck by a revived Destiny stating, I see timelines, past and future, which rings true in an entirely new light given the revelations of House of X number 2. It's not intentional, but the sequence now could be read as Destiny's admission of her knowledge of Moira's abilities. It's unfortunately also worth calling out that Blindfold commits suicide in the volume of Uncanny X-Men immediately preceding House of X, and as far as I know, has not been revived on Krakoa. Presumably by Moira's edict, she would not be allowed to resurrect, which is another issue that I think should come up along with Mystique's quest to bring back Destiny. That same arc includes some additional nuggets through the return of Proteus and Destiny's admission that his presence and power sets cloud her reads of the future. While this is obviously just meant in regards to the particular Necrotia story Mike Carey and company were telling, it also really fuels my ongoing theory that Proteus is a targeted part of Moira's Life 10 plan. Proteus is engineered by Moira as a means of giving birth to a mutant with reality warping abilities. This plays a role in making the Dream of the Five and mutant resurrection on Krakoa possible. That could be enough on its own, but what if Proteus' abilities also offered Myra a way to escape the predicted powers of Destiny? This offers some textual evidence that Proteus can uniquely impact Destiny, which is perhaps not at random. Speaking of major Hoxpox connections, Carrie's role throughout the entire Second Coming crossover event brings in Nimrods, Cypher traveling to the future to take on Master Molds, and evolving Omega Sentinels in the event's wake. While Second Coming is all a part of the larger crossover, Carrie uses the aftermath to explore the impact on Karima Shapander, the Omega Sentinel, and a character House of X fans will recognize from Project Orcus. The fallout means that Karima's Nimrod CPU was attacked by a virus Cypher created to stop time-traveling Nimrods, and that Karima more or less devolves into the out-of-control Omega Sentinel that the X-Men, you know, potentially feared her to be. This is a character who was human, was turned into, you know, transformed into an Omega Sentinel, and fights alongside the X-Men. She's a part of the initial X-Men roster, as Mike Carey writes it, and by the time we get to the aftermath of Second Coming, she is taken over. The Sentinel part of her sort of takes over, leading to the position we find her in, in uh, House of X and Powers of Ten. I think there's potentially a lot more to explore with her character as well, as sort of a, a deathlock of the mutant universe. 
On a final note from this time, there's also a continuation of the Gambit Death Apocalypse development that occurred in Blood of Apocalypse, the issues of X-Men immediately preceding Carrie's own run, when Gambit became Apocalypse's Horseman of Death. I truly do not remember if this ever saw a resolution, but given Gambit and Apocalypse's reluctant alliance in the Page of Dawn of X Excalibur, it certainly makes uh, sense, and it makes that relationship a heck of a lot more interesting, at least to me. Era number four in the Mike Carey run is Age of X and Legion. I'm generally a sucker for Age of and alternate realities in the Marvel Universe, but Carey's Age of X crossover never quite won me over all the way. The sudden alternate reality spread across some event issues, legacy, and new mutants issues also written by Carey features a world without X-Men. Just mutants hunkered down in a fortress defending wave after wave of humanity's hate. There are some memorable alt-reality interpretations of known characters, uh, Mike Carey and Gabriel hernandez Walta's origin for Basilisk, the psychologically decimated soldier version of Scott Summers, is a particular standout, but I'd actually argue the aftermath of the age, in which characters retain their memories of the alternate universe and have to decide whether or not to keep them, is the best part. Age of X is also the point where Carey very earnestly leans into the various connotations of legacy in the book's title. There's the legacy that Professor X has left behind for mutant kind as he reevaluates his decisions with the X-Men. But there's also Rogue's ability to absorb dissipating mutant memories into a walking database of mutant kind's history. Amazingly, she develops in ways not entirely dissimilar from the use of Cerebro, backing up all mutants in House of X. In the Age of X, she is quite literally codenamed Legacy, although Cannonball and others refer to her as Reaper due to her position absorbing powers when a soldier has fallen on the battlefield. Likewise, Legion is a genetic part of Professor X's legacy, and ultimately it's revealed that the Age of X is all a creation of one of Legion's powerful personas. This would all be well and good in the grand scheme of Legion, after all, he also basically starts the Age of Apocalypse through his actions, but the specifics of Legion's accidental alternate reality are so fascinating in the wake of House of X. In the Age of X, Legion operates as one of the five Force Warriors, with his mother, Moira McTaggart, awaiting him in the fortress. As she cracks in the false reality, uh, as the cracks in the false reality begin to show, it's revealed that Moira is really the one behind this reality, just wanting to create a space where Legion can be free from the sorts of medical experiments and fixes the likes of Dr. Nemesis would inflict upon him. Now, as the story is told, Moira in the Age of X is just the persona chosen for the rogue Legion personality that sets off the warped reality. There's no real Moira in this story, and as far as everyone reading X-Men comics in 2011 was, was concerned, she was very much dead. Nonetheless, I find it impossible not to consider the possibility. What if that was Moira? Or what if that foreshadows actions Moira might consider taking? A separate reality that she can control in order to ensure mutant victory. Why not? It's something she hasn't tried. Again, Moira's hiding plans. She refuses the existence of precognitive mutants on Krakoa because she doesn't want them to know her plans. Something like a warped reality bent by Legion to her whims is not out of the question. That said, I will admit here that I've been thinking more about Myra's secrets, and as fun as they are to theorize, it's also very, very plausible that she and the leading mutant triumvirate simply don't want their people to know Myra's story. The details that Myra has lived through nine lives of this, and lost every time, could be absolutely devastating to morale. We're in on the secret to create dramatic irony, but the likes of Cyclops, Wolverine, Storm, they don't know, or at least we don't know if they know. How different might everyone behave with the added weight that this is Moira's last-ditch effort to find a victory for mutants? I don't know that this necessarily plays well for all of Krakoa. I also wasn't planning on going into his 80s origins, but the inclusion of the Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz New Mutants number 27 as a backup in X-Men Legacy number 250 reminded me that Professor X seems entirely unaware that Legion is his son until that adventure in Legion's Fractured Psyche. And that's a, a story arc from, I think, New Mutants 26-28 that is a must-read um, for X-Men fans. If this holds true, this is actually quite important because it means that Moira somehow nudged Charles directly into the relationship with Gabriel Haller that led to the birth of the powerful mutant Legion. Remember, Moira finds genetic matches for herself and Charles to reproduce a reality-altering mutant. Until reading this, I had generally imagined that both of them were in on this plot, but the Professor's complete surprise at fatherhood makes me really wonder. Following the Age of X, Professor X and Dr. Nemesis create new technology for Legion to control his various personalities and abilities, which reveals the need to capture several escaped personalities from Legion's psyche. I don't have any broader connections here other than to say these are some very good Legion and X-Men comics, and if you're curious about checking out, um, you know, small sections of the Mike Carey run, try X-Men Legacy 250 to 253. Which brings us to the final era, era number five, 
Shi'ar Space and Regenesis. The Carrie era of X-Men concludes with a trip to Shi'ar Space and Rogue, Gambit, and Magneto's decisions following the Great Wolverine vs. Cyclops schism of 2011. It's almost a throwaway detail in one of my least favorite arcs in the run, but it is worth calling out that Rogue and company travel via wormhole from Shi'ar Space back to Terran Proximity. This of course calls to mind the likely reemergence of Moira's ninth life stalwarts, Omega, Rasputin, and Zorn. Again, the means of travel have been used. It's really just down to specifics and timing on when they'll pop back up again into the Krakoa era of X-Men. We certainly know at this point that it can be done. Which brings us to Carrie would return to the world of X-Men in 2014 with the original graphic novel X-Men No More Humans. And it's characteristically full of really cool seed ideas, what if humans disappeared overnight, and beyond smooth adaptation to the shared universe through lines. Mike Carey's out here weaving Battle of the Atom like it's nothing. Even here, in this generally overlooked and tepidly reviewed graphic novel, there are outstanding ideas. I'm particularly obsessed with now with the idea of alternate reality mutants from hopeless Earths. Would Krakoa be open to these alternate realities? How might they play a role in the stories to come? Again, even in work that isn't necessarily knockout, there's some really cool ideas that could be played with. So, that brings us to the end here. Whether or not the Children of the Vault remain the most direct connection between Hickman's X-Men and the Mike Carey run remains to be seen, but even if so, there are so many concepts and good stories in the second longest X-Men run ever that it's well worth exploring for any X-Men comic book fan. Alright, I love this run. I think you should check it out. Again, if you want to read Mike Carey's run on X-Men, go to X-Men number 188, the volume that began in 2004, and then you can read that on through to issue 207, and then you're going to jump to X-Men Legacy, which starts with issue number 208, and you'll read that all the way through to issue 260, bouncing out for uh, some of those Age of X crossovers and the like. Next time on Crack and Krakoa, what topics would you like to see covered? Here is what I have queued up for potential coverage. Omega Level Mutants, Explored. The Indie Titles of Jonathan Hickman. Zeb Wells' run on New Mutants, and this insane X-Men Cthulhu theory that I can't quite shake, and I don't know what to make of, but I've put a lot of panels and thoughts together, and I could explore it if you want me to. <laughs> that is the final option. Hey, thanks to everybody over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald for supporting the site and the shows. Uh, I have some mysterious benefactors in particular that I want to shout out. You can get a shout out of your own by going over to patreon.com slash comicbookherald and supporting the site at the Mysterious Benefactors tier. Thank you, Eric Hodges, Jeff Zacharias, Ron Paul Kirkley, Jesse W., Slatron, Robert Mickelson, Professor Pride, and Steve Brennan. And thanks to all those additional patrons at uh, other tier levels over on, on that site. It really means a lot to me that people uh, go over there and want to support Comic Book Herald and the work that I'm doing. So again, I'm Dave. You can find my work at comicbookherald.com, at Comic Book Herald, pretty much anywhere online. Please consider liking and subscribing and sharing to Best Comics Ever and My Marvelous Year podcast, as well, of course, as the Comic Book Herald channel on YouTube. Recently passed uh, 3,000 subscribers for the first time. So that is an exciting milestone. Uh, here's to the next, uh, you know, the next one of you. <laughs> I'm thinking on an individual level. Thanks to everybody who joins. And as always, I hope you will enjoy the comics.